Glory to God. Heaven all is all about worshiping God. Amen. The Father and the Son. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Well, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Turn, if you would, to two places today. I'm going to read the account from Matthew chapter 21 of what we know as the triumphal entry. And then I want to drop back to the prophet Zechariah. And we'll read uh, chapter 9 and verse 9 there. First of all, Matthew chapter 21. And beginning at verse number 1, we'll read down through verse number 11. Matthew 21 and 1. And when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem, and were come to Bethphage, unto the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus two disciples, saying unto them, Go into the village over against you, straightway ye shall find an ass tied, with a colt with her, loose them, and bring them unto me. And if any man say aught unto you, ye shall say, The Lord hath need of them, and straightway he will send them. All this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek, and sitting upon an ass, and a colt, the foal of an ass. And the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them, and brought the ass and the colt, and put on them their clothes, and they set him thereon. And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and strawed them in the way. And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Wow. Hallelujah. And when he was come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. Praise the Lord. Zechariah, the Old Testament prophet, chapter 9 and verse number 9. This is actually where I'm going to take my uh, outline from today. Zechariah 9 and 9, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, Thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly, and riding upon an ass and upon the, a colt, the foal of an ass. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you today for your presence that we feel in this place. Ah, oh, Lord, it's a, it's a wonderful thing that right here in the year of 2010, we feel the very presence of God. Oh, I thank you for it, Lord. I pray you'll reach out into hearts today, into our lives today. You know, Lord, what strength we need and what power we need and what hope we need. And oh, you're here, Lord, to do it for us. I appreciate that. I pray you would anoint the preaching of your word and speak to our hearts today. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I want to preach to you about the triumph of the triumphal entry. Amen. This is one of the most stirring incidents in the life of Jesus Christ. Just to visualize, to imagine this, uh, this slow procession into Jerusalem. He's riding on just a small donkey, and his disciples are walking alongside, 
And the people began to gather around and the excitement begins to build. And pretty soon they're cutting branches down off the trees and waving them in the air and putting them down on the road. They're taking their outer garments, their coats, their cloaks, and they're spreading them out in front of the Lord as he rides into town. They're shouting, Hosanna! Man, I love just reading what they said there in Matthew 21. Hosanna! Amen. To the Son of David, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Man, they were excited and they were shouting out their praises to God with loud voices. My, what a celebration. I know it really was a triumphal entry. Uh, and that's, that's what it's called. Matter of fact, your Bible probably, if it gives little uh, headings above the, up on the top of the page, that's what it's got on there. But what triumph are we celebrating here? Why is it called a triumphal entry? I mean, are we simply celebrating the fact that Jesus rode into town on a little donkey? And while he rode, people got excited, and they began to shout and react in emotional ways. Is that it? No, no, not at all. We are celebrating the triumphal entry because of its triumph. Amen. There are at least two things I want to tell you today, amen, that are very important about the triumphal entry. Amen. First of all is the prophetic importance of the triumphal entry. Amen. If, if you just read through it and you don't understand the setting and the purpose of it, you miss the main point. Amen. But the entire life of Jesus Christ had been one of fulfilling prophecy. From the very time of his birth, his birth fulfilled prophecy. He was born of a virgin. It had never happened before. It will never happen again. It was only for him. He was born in Bethlehem, according to prophecy. He was of the lineage of David, according to prophecy. He was born as God's own son and named Emmanuel, all of those things, and many, many more, according to prophecy. Even his childhood fulfilled prophecy. Amen. The Bible said he'd be called up out of Egypt, and he was. Amen. The Bible said that he would be raised in Nazareth, and he was. Amen. He'd be rejected by his own brethren, his own family brethren, and he was. Amen. That he would grow up as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. Amen. His ministry fulfilled prophecy. Amen. He was preceded by John the Baptist in the spirit of Elijah. He was anointed by the Holy Ghost to preach the gospel to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and the recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Amen. His entire ministry fulfilled prophecy. His death and resurrection would fill much, fulfill much prophecy too. Amen. There are numbers of prophecies throughout the Old Testament about his suffering, his death on a cross, his burial, his resurrection, but on this day today. Amen. He hasn't got the Calvary yet. He hasn't died on the cross. He hasn't been buried yet. Here on this day, as he quietly rides a donkey into Jerusalem, he was fulfilling very important prophecy. Amen. i got to take you back now to the book of Daniel, chapter 9. Daniel receives a vision, a revelation from God called the prophecy of the 70 weeks. God gave Daniel a full panoramic view of his dealings with the nation of Israel and the people of the Jews. Amen. God's plan for the nation of Israel would begin with a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem and end at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Amen. After the time of the tribulation and the outpouring of God's wrath on an unbelieving world. Amen. This outline that Daniel saw would encompass four 190 actual years of time, 70 weeks of seven years, not just seven days, and all of it relating to the Jews. There's going to be a gap in there of unknown duration. Amen. And here's what's important. The time clock 
for that vision of the prophecy of the 70 weeks began when the decree went out that the Jews could go back home with Nehemiah and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And they went home and they got busy working. And the very first section of that prophecy was a time of seven weeks or 49 years. And it covered from the time the decree went out until they completed the walls and they celebrated the... (laughs) The finished work in Jerusalem, that was the very first section of the prophecy. Then the second phase started. Amen. It began when the city of Jerusalem was rebuilt and would extend until the Bible said the Messiah, the Prince, had come. Hallelujah. 62 weeks, which amounted to 434 years, making the total of 69 weeks or 483 years. And losing those numbers, did I? This is the first reason why the triumphal entry is so important. On that day, when all of Israel watched there in Jerusalem and Christ began riding into the town of Jerusalem on the donkey, amen, now was when this 69th week had been completed. Amen. He was fulfilling the very next important phase in God's plan. Zechariah declared it in the text I read to you today. Behold, thy king cometh. Amen. This was Messiah the prince. This was Israel's king. He was riding into Jerusalem upon an ass, upon a colt, the foal of an ass, just as Zechariah had prophesied. Amen. My, what a glorious day. God had kept his word. The Messiah had come. No, he wasn't going to set up an earthly kingdom at this time. But he was Israel's deliverer and Israel's king. Amen. You realize that the majority of the people standing out there that day, they didn't even get the point. God had given this prophecy literally hundreds and even a thousand and beyond years before. And they were there that day. And this very simple, small procession was a milestone. From God's word. Hey, I'll tell you what. God never gets confused. God never makes a mistake. Amen. Every prophecy he ever made, it will be fulfilled. Every prediction God ever gave, it will come true. Hallelujah. Everything that he has promised, it will be done. Amen. God said, here's exactly what I'm going to do, and he nailed it down by the number of years. Amen. He said it's going to be this many years from the time they say they're going to build the wall till they're done. It's going to be this many years from the time that job is finished till Messiah the Prince comes. And on that day, Christ came riding into Jerusalem as the Prince and the King of Israel. Hallelujah. God said it and God did it. Amen. God has his own timing and nothing man can do can hinder God's plan. I said nothing that man can do can hinder God's plan. Think of what had happened in those 430-some years of time. Oh, there had been a lot of wars going on. The Maccabees had fought among the people of Israel. They had been resisting Roman rule. The Romans had conquered the known world. I mean, everything looked like it was all in the control of the Caesar. But it was not in the control of the Caesar. It was in the control of Almighty God. And no matter what Caesar decreed, and no matter what rules Caesar passed, and no matter what laws the Roman Senate made, amen, nothing they did would make God change His plan. He had to make no changes in it. He worked it out perfect. Ah, oh, what a triumph that was. Hallelujah. Before I go on, let me finish up. Amen. This subject because the 70 weeks are not over yet. There's still one week of seven years to go. Amen. This finished up the first 69 of the 70. They have been absolutely fulfilled. Amen. But between that 69th, when Christ rode into Jerusalem, 
and with just a few days, within a few days, suffered on Calvary, died, was buried, rose from the dead, ascended into heaven, sent the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost. Amen. There has been a gap. There's been a time of about 1,980 years, almost 2,000, we say, amen, that's passed in between. And that last week has not yet been fulfilled. And in our day, there are people who don't believe it ever will. But, now I'd like to, you know, I mean, I just, I think different, a lot of people. There, there are 70 weeks in that prophecy, and I just kind of, I don't know, I just kind of got the feeling that if 69 out of 70 are already done, you can pretty well count on the last one. What do you think? I mean, I'd, I'd figure if you had 35 out of 70, you'd still have a pretty good chance it's going to be all done. But when you got 69 out of 70, and when it's God who said it, hey, this prophecy is going to be done. It is going to be completed. Now, you can sit here today and look at me like I've lost my mind and like I'm off into science fiction somewhere, but I'm not. Well, my feet are firmly planted in the Word of God, and if you don't believe it, you're the one with the problem. Amen, because it is going to happen, and whether or not you're ready, that's up to you. But that 70th week is going to come about. How do you know when it starts? Well, God said that 70th week starts when a treaty is signed with Israel that allows the Jews to build their own temple and institute their sacrificial system of worship in their own temple, and they are promised they will be unmolested and protected for seven years. Now, I know I don't want to bog you down in too much deep prophecy today. There are a lot of people who think that the rapture of the church starts the tribulation. That is not so. And there are a lot of people who think that you could be in the tribulation and not know it. And that's not so either. Now, I'm not trying to pick on you today. I'm just saying I've got my feet planted firmly in the Bible here. Amen. That 70th week does not start at the coming of the Lord. That 70th week cannot start without anybody knowing it. That 70th week starts when a national, international treaty is signed and Israel is specifically given permission to build their temple or if they've already been building it, they'll have permission to go in that temple and start their sacrificial worship and they'll be told, you got seven years treaty, you will be unmolested and you will be protected. That's the 70th week. However, halfway through, that 70th week at the three and a half years out of the seven years that same world leader who made this covenant with the Jews will break it he will come into the temple and make them stop their sacrifices to God he will set himself up as God in that very temple and demand that not only the Jews but that the entire world worship him and Israel will go through a time of suffering and persecution that is extremely severe. Amen. When that 70th week, that time of seven years, comes to an end, the Antichrist and all of his armies will be gathered against Israel, and their goal will be to wipe Israel totally off the face of the earth. You ever wonder why there's so much hatred against Israel? The nation of Israel is smaller than most all the states of America. It's a tiny space of land. And as tiny as a space of land as they have, everybody in the world, God forbid, including people in America who ought to know better, but even our own leaders, which I don't take any blame for what they're doing because I didn't vote for any of them to get in. So whatever they're doing, they're doing it totally on their own. My hands are clean before God. Hallelujah. Amen. They're going over to Israel and telling them, you got too much land. You need to give up some more land. you got to let these other Palestinians have more land. you got to give up part of Jerusalem. you got to give up Jerusalem. you got to cohabit. And they're constantly pressuring Israel to give up what little bit of land they do have and what they have fought tooth and toenail to get out of all the millions of acres in the Middle East. They only have a little bit. Nobody's happy about that. They all want Israel's land taken away. You know why? That's because the devil's behind it all. Amen. And the Antichrist who hates God and hates Jesus Christ will bring all the armies of the world against that little nation of Israel after he has persecuted them severely, after they're at their weakest point, their military has been totally dismantled. They no longer have government of their own. He's going to
to try to totally destroy them off the face of the earth. And then Jesus Christ intervenes. On the day of the triumphal entry, he rode quietly and meekly into town on a little small donkey. That finished up week number 69 out of the 70. But when it comes time to finish up week number 70, he's going to come riding out of heaven on a white horse. Hallelujah. Read about it. The book of Revelation. Man, it's great. Amen. He's got a sword going out of his mouth. He's dressed in royal robes because he is the Word of God and the Lord of lords and the King of all kings. Hallelujah. He is going to bring the Antichrist and all the armies of the world down to defeat. Amen. And guess who gets to ride with him? The army of the saints of God, and that's us. Hallelujah. We didn't get to be there when the 69th week finished up. We're reading about it and talking about it. Amen. But we get to be there when the 70th week finishes up and we come riding back with the Lord. Amen. And he defeats the Antichrist and the armies of the world. The Antichrist and the false prophet are cast into hell. Jesus will be believed on by the Jews. They'll accept him as their Messiah. They'll accept him as the Christ, the anointed one. He will be their king. Hallelujah. Behold, thy king cometh. Hey, I'm telling you what. Amen. This was a very important day prophetically, and it reminds all of us today there are yet very important days ahead of us. You better be making your plans to be prepared for them because they're going to come no matter what you do, no matter what you think. No matter what you believe, they're going to come no matter what Obama does and what Obama thinks, what Obama believes. They're going to come regardless of what Joe Biden says. Oh, I tell you, they're, they're really starting to pick on the, the evangelical right. Yeah, they're picking on those fundamentalists. They say we're the reason why there's so much resistance to the health care plan. Because all I don't, I mean, that, that, I don't, I don't really like what they're trying to do, but that really don't matter a whole lot to me. I'm a whole lot more worried about abortion and homosexuality and perversion than I am about their health care plan. Amen. I can live with that. I mean, God will take care of me if he has to without any of them doing anything. So I'm not a whole lot worried about that. I'm going to tell you what. They can raise every law they want to raise. Amen. They can make every statement they want to make. And they may think they're on top of the world. But I'm going to tell you what. When it's all said and done, Jesus Christ will be the king. Hallelujah. He will come. He will defeat all that the devil has tried to do. And that takes me to the next part. Amen. That's important about this triumphal entry. That's not the prophetic importance, but the personal importance. Because some of you right here today, you're already thinking about turkey and ham. You're not too concerned about the 70 weeks. But the day will come when you will be. As far as I know, I'm not going to be here to encourage you through them. So you better get a hold of something from God on your own. Hallelujah. Well, praise the Lord. I get a feeling a lot of our holiness Pentecostal churches, we say we believe stuff that we don't really believe. Otherwise, we wouldn't act like we do in church. And we wouldn't act like we do on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. We don't really believe what we say we believe. But I'm going to tell you what. It's going to happen. And when it does, and you weren't ready, you're going to remember everything I said to you about it. It's all going to come to your mind. Because I don't plan on being here, like I said, to help you through it all. You're going to have to get a hold of God for yourself, friend. Amen. But it's going to happen as sure as I'm alive today and standing behind this pulpit. Amen. It's going to happen. Amen. i got to go on. There is a very personal importance at this triumphal entry. Zechariah said, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee, having salvation. Praise the Lord. There is a glorious personal blessing that we have all been given by the fulfillment of this prophecy. He came to be our king. Not just Israel's king. He came to be our king. 
Amen. Each and every one of us, he came to us. He came bringing salvation. Amen. Now, Israel had the totally wrong idea about the coming of the Messiah at that point. They thought he was going to come and set up an earthly kingdom. They wanted to rule. They wanted to have a king, and they wanted their own land, and they wanted their own nation. They wanted their own dominion. They wanted their own sovereignty, but they didn't get it. That's not why he came the first time. Amen. What he came to do was not to defeat the Roman Empire and dethrone the Roman emperor. He came on a lot bigger mission than that. Hallelujah. Amen. You know, that's so ironic about human nature. We decide in our own mind what God ought to do because we know what's most important. So Israel had decided the most important thing was they needed out from under Roman rule. They needed to get out from under that Roman governor and that Roman Caesar. They needed somebody to get them out from under Roman rule. That was the most important thing, but it wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't, near, it wasn't, even, it wasn't even close to the most important thing. Because you could live and die under a Roman emperor and still go to heaven. So that was not the most important thing. Amen. God had a lot bigger mission. And you know what? There's some of those things you've picked out that you think God needs to do that are so important to you, and God's saying, you're not even seeing the whole picture, friend. I guess I'm a whole lot bigger to do than that. Hallelujah. Man, you're all getting quiet here today. Amen. I hope, I hope you're getting quiet because you're scared about what's going to happen in the future. I hope you're scared enough you're going to pray about it. That's what I hope. Well, hallelujah. Amen. But the fact of the matter is God came on a much bigger mission whole lot bigger than defeating the Roman Empire and defeating the Roman Emperor. He came to defeat the power of sin and dethrone the devil himself. Amen. It doesn't matter as far as man's concerned whether it's a Roman Emperor or a Greek Emperor or a Russian Tsar or an American President. If the devil's still in charge, it don't matter who the man is. God came to deal with the bigger problem. He came to dethrone the devil. Hallelujah. John said, for this purpose, the Son of Man, the Son of God, was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Hallelujah. Amen. When the Lord came riding into Jerusalem that day, he was not interested in setting up an earthly kingdom. He had a lot bigger job to do. And that's why Jesus said, now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. Jesus came to earth to grapple with the devil. Hallelujah. Amen. I didn't know he did it in an unusual way, but it worked. Amen. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Hey, I want to tell you what, friend, today, this day has personal significance for you. Amen. He came riding into Jerusalem having salvation. Hallelujah. And he went all the way to Calvary and he died. And he went all the way in the tomb and was buried. And he rose again on the third day alive forevermore. And he says to you today, I have salvation for you. I'll tell you why your life's so miserable. You think it's because you don't have enough money. You don't think you own enough stuff. You don't have the job. That you really ought to have. You think you're miserable, miserable because of your husband or your wife. Or because of your friends or family. The reason you're miserable is because you don't have Jesus in charge of your life. And it's not going to get any better. It's only going to get worse. Hallelujah. Oh, I know. I know you think you're on top of the world. You're making your own plans. You're doing your own thing. Nobody's going to tell you what to do. Surprise, surprise. Somebody's already telling you what to do. Amen. You're disobey when you disobey the Bible, guess who's telling you what to do? The devil. 
That's exactly right. Every time you do anything that disobeys the Scripture, the devil's telling you what to do. Amen. And how ridiculous is that? Because God loved the world so much. Amen. He gave His own Son. Amen. He loved the world, including you. And He sent His Son. He was lifted up on the cross. Amen. He died to pay for sin, including yours. Hallelujah. Amen. He did bring salvation. He brought it to you. Amen. Oh, that's why this is a glorious day. Because while you sit right here in Junction Hill Pentecostal Church on March the 28th of 2010, salvation has been brought to you. Glory to God. He brought it to you. Not to this church as a group, but to you individually. Amen. So now, let me ask you, have you fulfilled the requirement that whosoever believeth in him, that includes you. You have to believe. Amen. And if you do, then you will not perish, but you will have everlasting life. And that includes you. Let's stand today.